Hello, it's Jason Heath with yet another Contrabass Conversations episode solo show. This is four of six solo shows here in the month of March. Boy, I, haven't, I don't think I've ever recorded this many solo shows in a row. It's been an interesting experience. Here it is again, an evening in San Francisco. My wife is at work, working nights this week. So what do I do? But I sit in front of Ableton Live, the software I use to record this podcast, and we're going to talk about that software today, and we're digging into another solo show, this time about something near and dear to my heart and that I rarely talk about on the podcast, probably pretty much never talked about on the podcast, but that is my secret former other life as an electronic dance music EDM teacher. <laughs> at the high school level. And it's something that has percolated. I'm not kidding. We'll talk about that. That something is, It's something that has percolated into all other aspects of my teaching. And it's something that I really enjoy and geek out on and have a good time with. So that's what today's episode is. And it is based upon a presentation that I just gave at the Texas Music Educators Association, TMEA, their conference in February. 2019 here. So we're going to be talking about what I've discovered in the world of electronic music and apps and software and how I've used it and how I've transferred that over into my base teaching, into a classroom teaching setting, and into even large ensembles like orchestra. But first, some backstory. How did an orchestra guy like me bass player, played an orchestra my whole life, and I was even at the point that this developed, I was teaching orchestra full-time. So how did an orchestra guy end up getting into the world of EDM, getting into the world of electronic music, and exploring all of this stuff? Uh, well, here we go. I got a job at the high school where Ferris Bueller's Day Off was filmed, Glenbrook North High School, and in my presentation, on this topic, I show some photos from Ferris Bueller with the sports car out front, which is actually the hall where the high school orchestra plays, and talk about that school. And when I got this job, I was teaching orchestra, but they also gave me the option of either teaching guitar or electronic music. And I mean, it's a pretty natural fit for a bass player and someone who plays bass guitar, which most bass players play at least some bass guitar, to play guitar. And I can play some chords on guitar. I mean, most bass players can. So that seemed like a no-brainer. But the idea of electronic music intrigued me, and I really had no idea what was going on in that class. So I took a day off at my the job I was leaving and went and checked out this class in action. And what I discovered was it was essentially a music theory class just happening in front of computers using Sibelius is what they were using. And they also had an AP music theory class at the exact same high school meeting in the same room. So there was a lot of overlap. And the department supervisor said, if you do want to take this class on, we'd love to see it go in a different direction. And so I said, sure, let's try it. Sounds like a kind of a cool challenge. And I started geeking out, digging in, going on YouTube and just watching, and I think probably even just typing in electronic music. What does that mean? I thought at first, I remember some very academic class at Northwestern on the topic and all sorts of bleeps and bloops and tape uh, pieces, and I think that's probably what I was thinking of at first. But I quickly realized that there was a whole world out there, not like I wasn't unaware of EDM or um, house music or dubstep or anything like that. But as I started to explore online, I, I discovered this piece of software called Ableton Live. Many of you may know this. Probably, my guess is probably most people listening to this have not checked out Ableton Live. Boy, is this a cool piece of software. I'm going to put a link to Ableton and... I guess I'll try to describe what makes this software uniquely suited to teaching for me. So Ableton has two, it's, it's unique or it's, it, it distinguishes itself in that it has an interface that can be viewed on just one screen. So all the menus and the different elements that you can be seeing are on one screen so that you can use it without a lot of flipping between different windows. It's really built 
the Ableton Live is at Orly Ableton. You hear them both used interchangeably, but it is software designed to be used in a live setting. So if you see someone up there DJing in front of a huge crowd, it's very, very, very likely that they are using Ableton Live to drive that performance. Again, some people who are into electronic music could probably describe this better than me, but I will do my pedestrian best. Ableton has two views, and they're, they're, they're like two windows into the same information. It has a timeline view, kind of like GarageBand or Pro Tools or Logic or any other kind, or you know, video editing software or anything like that. And then it has what, and that's called arrangement view. And then it has what's called session view, which is where it really gets interesting. It's like an, I refer to it as an Excel spreadsheet, but for music. It's a, it's a grid and the columns are instruments and we can define instruments very broadly for this. So each one of these rows has, a, or I'm sorry, columns rather, has ha, can have multiple clips in it. So you can come up with a whole bunch of different riffs, or if you're chopping up some sort of sample, you can have different pieces of the sample in there, and you can combine them all. You can only have one clip playing in each column, but you can have as many columns as you want, and they can all be playing different clips. And, and then when you get a sound you like, you can save that as what's called a scene. And a scene is a row. So you've got your instruments, which are columns, and you've got your scenes, which are rows. And this software, this is probably super dry, so I, I will, I will uh, speed up this summary. Uh, it, it, it's, it lends itself to improvisation and kind of jamming and grooving. And then when you find a sound you like, it allows you to capture that sound. And then you can very organically build a song. I, I find the process, uh, me personally, and I found this with students time and time again, it's a very organic, uh, creative process. So I discovered the software. I said, this rocks. We're totally going to use this thing. And then I had to sell this to the administration at the school, which turned out to be easy. The superintendent for technology was a, was a cool guy, and he, I j basically took him down, and I had him DJ with me. <laughs> and he went nuts for it and spent I don't know how much money, but we got a, a full professional level Ableton Live install, which retails for like eight or $900. So I'm sure he got it for less at an educational price, but we had that on 25 workstations and there was this device called the APC-40, which is a MIDI controller designed to be used for Ableton Live. And it kind of takes that session view I was talking about and turns it into a physical uh, controller. And it, I got one of those myself. I bought a whole bunch of MIDI controllers. I bought a Novation Launchpad. I bought this amazing device called the MIDI Fighter that I use to this day for all sorts of things, um, all sorts of keyboards and doodads and whatnot things. And they all work really well with Ableton Live. The APC was particularly cool to me at the time because it really was a physical manifestation of that arrangement view, which I just fallen in love with. And they got one of those for every single workstation. So we had 25 APC 40s and 25 Ableton Lives yeah, or installs, and we were good to go. And the class had like six kids in it when, when uh, we started the semester, I think. So <laughs> we had way more capacity than we needed, but the class became popular. And I'll talk about what's, what exactly went on in there in just a second. But by the time I left the job, two years later, we had over 100 people signed up for that year. So we went from under 10 to over 100. So what did we do in there? Uh, I realized, so this is a semester class. So it was offered twice a year. And people were, they could sign up for one semester and then that would be it. Or they could take it over and over and over again. And what I realized was there's a slippery slope when you're doing electronic music and, and when you're thinking about theory, how much theory, how to dig into that, what to do in terms of that. And I realized that if I focused on theory really at all, it was turning into a beginner music theory class. And I wanted to see if I could not let it be that. So 
I will actually hear it. Let's hear from our sponsors and then we'll come back and I'll tell you what I did and it worked like a charm and I just love talking about this. So here's a word from the folks to keep the lights on here at Contrabass Conversations. This episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass and I've always been impressed by how Steve manages to get basses sounding so vibrant, whether it's a student level bass or a top of the line professional bass. Here's Steve on some of what he has learned in terms of setup. When steel strings came into general use around 1959, the German bass makers flipped out and they really got scared that they're going to get big shiploads of basses back that got wrecked by these high tension steel strings. And so they did three things that really changed the function of the instrument. They shortened the string length and they lowered the neck angle so the bridges weren't that tall anymore. And then they made the tops a lot thicker. They really wanted to ensure that these bases were not going to come back across the ocean uh, for work anymore. And so the bases tend to sound kind of nasal, and they didn't have any depth. They didn't have a chest voice at all, you know. And so what we do with increasing the neck angle, and we can also increase the overstands for modern play, can get up in a thumb position a lot easier. So a neck reset can accomplish that. Sometimes we'll transplant a neck or make a new neck for these basses that might have a string length that are not friendly to modern playing. Learn more about what Steve can do to get your bass playing better and check out his great selection of basses at steveswanstringbass.com. And thanks for sponsoring the podcast, Steve. What is an American style of bass? Here's Gary and Eric from Upton Bass on the topic. So there's a joke about American instruments, right? Um, if I can take four violins and go to, a, let's say, a top-notch violin appraiser, and he can take the first one out and look at it and go, well, this one's clearly Italian because of all these features. Next one, well, this is French because of all these features. Next one, no, this is English because of these features. Fourth violin, they can't tell what it is, and then they go, ah, it's American. It's got a little bit of everything. Learn more about their Bostonian American style model and so many other things that they have to offer you at UptonBase.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by D'Addario Strings. Our friends at D'Addario want to help listeners change their strings safely and efficiently, and they have a few tricks to help you achieve that. Apply graphite, like pencil lead, to the bridge and nut, the contact points of the string, to ensure the strings slide smoothly on their way up to tension. This prevents them from getting stuck and unwinding or pulling the bridge so that it leans. Learn more at orchestral.dedario.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Okay, we are back. So what did I do to structure this class? I decided to take a, I call it a Lego approach to teaching music, which is I created all these MIDI files, very short MIDI files and and sound files of elements of music. So like a C major chord, C minor chord, uh, some drum samples, some sequences that we could move in to get common drum sounds, just kind of like a bunch of things that we could then build our musical versions of Lego castles with. Very user-friendly, hard to make bad sounds, and it was a great way to get people playing around, kind of like a visual art class, but for music. The first semester, I tried to teach everybody some piano stuff, and I just remember seeing the drool coming out of the, the mouth and the eyes glazing over, and I realized, okay. And then the other thing that happened was at, it, after that first semester, especially, the, the class started to get popular word started to spread. Hey, we're doing dance music in, in school. Let's check this out. So I started to get a lot of students coming in, many of whom were, had no musical experience whatsoever. They said, music's awesome. I don't know anything about it, uh, but I'd love to explore. And you had people that had like 10 years of piano experience that, oh, you know, I didn't have anything to do music-wise in high school now, but I can do this thing. So the skill level was so uneven throughout the class that that I, I would either be boring or confusing uh, at least half the class with anything I did as a group. So I decided no group instruction. This was going to be completely independent study, which could be a challenge, but... This school, Glenbrook North, had a very cool program where students could essentially sign up 
and something that was interesting to them to be TAs, teaching assistants. And they would get credit. It would go on as a TA sort of class. Very uh, progressive. Great idea. And so uh, some of those electronic music geeks that started out with me at the very beginning and they were into the idea, they just took it every single semester and they became uh, uh, teachers. They, th- Me and them, I, th- we'd have four or five of us counting me and so we could circulate. They were 90-minute classes every other day. And I could circulate and get to every student in the class every couple of weeks, let's say. And then the uh, the students that were helping me teach were able to get in too. So everybody was getting attention at least every other class. And because, and because I focused it totally on what they wanted to do, uh, there were no issues with being on task or discipline or anything. In fact, the administration started to come in and observe this class because uh, as a model for like how to reach a population that was maybe not the, the academically strongest. A lot of people getting suspended or failing other classes, but they just sat down and they dug in in that class. And we did a lot of what I call tune modeling, which is I would say, what's, what's a tune you like? Could be any genre. A lot of dubstep in that class. Some some metal. A um, lot of EDM. A lot of house music. A lot of trap. A lot of all, all kinds of stuff. And and so we would take that song. And there's a really cool thing you could do in Ableton, which is you can extract to a degree the melody. You can extract to the degree to a degree the harmony and also the rhythm. So you can actually take a song or a portion of a song. And you can get a reasonable MIDI version of the hook or the intro or something like that. And that was a great starting point because we could take a song, I could convert it, and then we could create our own virtual instruments that would then be playing that. And and we would then try to figure out how to get the timbre of those different instruments. So you'd have some sort of, you know, dirty synth bass, and then how do you get that? You start off with this simple sine wave <laughs> oscillator, and how do you get from that to this? And that's where the magic came in, and and it really was like sculpture for music. And and that's just what I love so much about Able and Live. I just had, it, it and it worked so devastatingly well. I, I just... Loved that approach so much. Now, earlier, I mentioned this device called the MIDI Fighter, which is still one of my favorite devices. I use it uh, not every week, but at least every month in teaching to this day. It is a, it is awesome. First of all, I'll put a link. And my MIDI Fighter of choice was the MIDI Fighter 3D. So this device has 16 buttons, Japanese arcade style buttons, very durable. And it is a a gyroscopic controller as well. So as you tilt it, you can activate whatever you want to program in there in terms of effects. Now this... Software, uh, well, it, it runs in Ableton Live. So I, I maybe you can use it outside of Ableton. I never have. I've always used Ableton Live. But the company, uh, DJ Tech Tools, they have all these free downloadable packs. So you can just get going with it really quickly. As long as you have Ableton Live and you have one of these devices, you can add there are dozens, maybe even hundreds at this point, of these packs that are just built for playing around with. And I, I've i never seen anything that's as much of a kid magnet as the MIDI fighter. I would leave that thing plugged in in my office all the time. And if it's if it goes into sleep mode, it starts to make all these cool uh, visual uh, patterns with their the LEDs on the buttons. The buttons are all LED, uh, they have tons of different colors. And, and it just pulls people in. And as soon as you start to play with it, there's some Something about the experience of using that thing that is just totally captivating. And for me too, I'll lose hours with this thing. I still will lose hours. And you you saw students just go nuts with this thing and start exploring sound and using their hands to explore sound. And I saw so many times two students come up and without any prompting on me whatsoever, I'm just watching them interact, they would start to kind of do a duet on the MIDI fighter. I would never call it a duet. That sounds way too nerdy. Not to them, anyway. But they would start to create some stuff. That got me thinking, and I applied for a grant, and I got eight of these awesome things at that Glenbrook North uh, job. Eight of these controllers, and we had MIDI fighter ensemble. We could have someone doing vocal chops, somebody doing drums, some people doing sound effects. Just so incredibly cool. 
I also when and then by the way, I left that job because uh, for many reasons it was a extremely frustrating place to work. Uh, I was never as unhappy in my professional life as I was those two years, despite the fact that I had that awesome class. Uh, maybe someday I'll talk more fully about that. I could I could write a very entertaining book about those two years, which I. Well, probably not do because that'd be bad karma. But anyway, <laughs> I quit the job, which I, I I feel I feel for the person who took over because it was one of these crazily specific things that nobody is trained for in the music schools I've spent time at. Anyway, so I, I kind of built a, a, a confusing mess <laughs> for them. But uh, oh man, I just can't say enough good things about teaching, using Ableton Live, and using devices like the APC-40 and the MIDI Fighter. And that, using devices like that, or the launch pad, or the machine, the native instruments machine, I have all of those things right behind me in my studio here. That, using those, people refer to that as controllerism. It's not playing an instrument, but it has elements of playing an instrument. And I like to refer to it as kind of training wheels for an instrument. And I, I do like to bring this up when I do a talk about this, just philosophically. Uh, if you're using a device like that, are you playing an instrument? Is that equivalent to playing violin or clarinet? And I think the answer is pretty obviously no, because you can just sound good by pressing a button right away. But I will tell you this, having used those devices for years and years and years, I can feel the same synapses in my brain activating when I am using one of those controllers as when I'm playing bass or conducting or doing anything musical. So there is uh, a strong element of instrumentalism to these controller devices. And in a way, it's kind of like a next generation instrument because you can make it do absolutely anything. You can play a synthesizer line. You can have every single button be a symphonic hit, or uh, you can cut up a Kanye West tune, or you could combine them all on a, on a, uh, the 16 buttons. And then with the MIDI fighter 3d, you can add all sorts of filters and effects and stutters as you turn the device and it's like you're piloting a sonic spaceship. It's just absolutely amazing. So I have, uh, so, okay, first of all, teaching that class, that was cool. So that's kind of like how I use that in the classroom. In the private lesson, eh, I don't. I haven't really used that much in the private lesson except for goofing around, but it's so fun. And just to sort of get that wonder and that magic and that awe of music, I think it's great for that. I've used it a lot in orchestra, which probably most people have not done, but I've found many uses. Uh, I was, I've always been obsessed with trying to, ever since I discovered this electronic music, I've been obsessed with trying to find a way to combine orchestra and EDM, and I've never really been thrilled with the results, but I have done it many times. I have videos, and I... And people have a whole lot of fun. I did this Daft Punk Pentatonics remix, and and I arranged it for string orchestra. And then I had this guy who's really into electronic music, essentially DJ, using Ableton Live, but then also doing all sorts of effects and and firing off Daft Punk clips on the MIDI Fighter. So that is very cool. The other thing I used the MIDI Fighter for a lot, like daily, it was in freshman orchestra, I would have one of those pre-built sound packs like I was talking about, and I would ask for volunteers, and every single hand would go up because every kid wanted to do this. I would take two students because I discovered just organically watching people that pairing up on one MIDI fighter is a really natural thing, and I would tell them, you, uh, you take this and go in my office, and in 40 minutes, you're going to come back, and you're going to do something for the class, but it has to have a beginning a middle and an end. And here's what I don't want. I'd always demo and then I just like thwonk away on the buttons and make a, a mess, <laughs> sonic mess. And I it was it was amazing. They would go and I heard so many cool improvisations, compositions, form, whatever you want to call it. But I found that that was actually an awesome way to teach form in a very non-threatening way and and such a more fun way than uh, other ways I'd tried. I, I'm, I'm, I can't say enough good things about that device. You got to have Ableton Live to, to make it work. I'm 99% sure anyway, but it, it is totally awesome. And then I also used it for some concerts. We did a video game concert. The last 
concert I ever did uh, while I was still teaching high school was this tribute to video games and was madness and a lot of fun. And I would always try to enlist the students in these projects and say, hey, I've got this idea for a video game concert. What do you think? Uh, go. And I would get all these ideas, and a lot of them would never work, but I always got some gems. You know what? I do that to this day. I do that all the time. If you are on any of my social media uh, channels or our Contrabase Conversations Facebook group or whatever, you will see me do that. I might not be super overt, but I'm always crowdsourcing ideas for projects. I, I do that for the... I mean, aside from these solo shows you're listening to here in March of 2019, uh, every guest you're hearing these days is crowdsourced. So I would crowdsource my concerts with the kids. Now, obviously, I would be filtering and thinking, and I wouldn't do that necessarily for the regular, uh, more traditional programs, but especially for things that I was doing out of the box, which I would usually do do near the end of the year when uh, the AP testing and kids were gone for field trips and whatever. Not a good time to push like a Bartok piece or something like that. No, no, no. That was the time to do a movie concert and to do a video game concert. And I want to describe to you this madness that was Super Mario Brothers live, but let's take one more break and thank the people that make this podcast happen each week, our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by the Bass Violin Shop, which opened in 2001 as a small double bass workshop in Greensboro, North Carolina. Today, they're staffed by three full-time, highly skilled bass luthiers, and they specialize in double bass sales, rentals, setup, restoration, and repair. For nearly 20 years, they have satisfied thousands of clients by offering quality instruments, knowledgeable service, reliable repairs, and superior restorations at affordable prices. They proudly offer the largest variety of fine bases and bows in the Southeast. You can find something at every price point by makers such as Thomas Martin, Bill Lakeberg, Romano Solano, Lemur Music, all Shen models, K, Epiphone, and bows by Louis Morizo, Fuchs, Nuremberg, Arcos Brazil, and others. For more information and current inventory, visit their website at BassViolinShop.com and be sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram. One of the great bass players of all time, Fred Zimmerman, former principal bass of the New York Philharmonic. He was Barry Colstein of Colstein Music. He was Barry's bass teacher. Here's Barry on Fred Zimmerman. Anybody that knew Fred would say he was one of a kind. I mean, the man was probably the most talented, the most giving. Um, he was the most interesting. Not only was he an amazing teacher, I mean, an amazing performer, he was an amazing, amazing artist also. He was truly a great artist. Along with Fred Zimmerman, people like Milt Hinton, Homer Mensch, Orrin O'Brien, and so many others have had their bases worked on at Colstein's or had instruments made for them by Colstein's. Thank you, Barry, for everything that you've done for the bass world. And folks, check them out at Colstein.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Okay, we are back. And so, Super Mario Brothers Live. I don't even remember who came up with this idea, but as we were thinking about a video game concert, I, why I, that came up. I don't know if it was me who suggested it, but the idea of playing a game came up right away. And I, or a student, probably a student, frankly, um, we decided to try to make something live happen. So a student would be playing Super Mario Brothers and we would play the music that should be happening. I learned quickly there are seven possible musical directions you can go in level one of Super Mario Brothers, which is what we performed live, which was madness and great. Uh, it is, let's see if I can remember some of them. It's just the regular da 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 boom, you know, that that thing. And then going down the pipe into the underworld, which is a lot of fun to teach string players. <laughs> Super chromatic. Um, let's see, you got a star. That would be... Then you could... You jump on the flagpole at the end. All these arpeggios. That was also fun to teach. I remember. Uh, you could die. Uh, and a couple more that I, I can't remember. Oh, I I think that when you were running out of time, there would be something. So we had seven pieces of music. I went on to MuseScore, which I will also link to. MuseScore is both an open source 
finale Sibelius-esque music notation software. Very useful. Uh, it's in a teaching setting, especially, so you don't have to require that people buy a commercial program. And they have a great and vast user library, user-generated music library. And if you can think of it, if it's popular even vaguely, it's going to be on MuseScore. Someone's going to have arranged it. So I would download these things constantly and rearrange them for my groups. So we did that with Super Mario Brothers. Seven potential fragments, put them all in front of them, and then I realized... Uh, okay, but we'll not have the sound on. So how can we hear, don't we want to hear Mario jumping around? Wouldn't it be lame to not hear Mario like crushing bricks and hopping on the Goomba, whatever they are called, the little mushroom people. Uh, So I got all the sounds and I think that there are less than 16. Maybe there are 16, but enough to fit on the MIDI fighter, downloaded those sounds, put them on the MIDI fighter. And I had my assistant orchestra director, who is such a cool guy, uh, Eric Linus Bagley, learned how to play that flipping thing, which is totally not crazy that you would learn like where all the jump but that's what i love about the device the device it could be anything that you want it to be so for that moment it was all the sounds of super mario brothers and so he got that thing down and you want to talk about a fun thing to rehearse <laughs> the get, call up a flash version or however the heck we did it of mario this uh, violist in freshman orchestra would be playing furiously and we would be practicing all this stuff and i learned quickly that that I, I could hold up between one and seven fingers to get them to know what to do, but they were not quick enough to make the change unless I also jumped in the air. So I w- did that, and I've watched the video, and it's pretty hilarious. I'm glad I didn't fall off the podium. And then for the concert, because why not, we added a snare drummer. We had a fabulous snare drum player, just percussionist in general, there at, at at my school. And so he was up there right next to me, kind of drumming out, adding a little bit of class, fantastic musician to this whole thing. That thing, that that was one of my, I love projects like that because it's pulling in all these dis, disparate elements. It's involving the students too, because they help with the arrangement, they help with the ideas, the execution. It's one of those things that I even remember, I think I even said to the audience, this might not work at all. And it did work. And I remember that, but that was sort of the fun of that. And I I just love projects like that where you're teetering on the edge. One more project like that we did, and it was a piece called Press by, let me look him up. That's right. Vince Oliver is, is his name. Vince Oliver, the Saratoga Strings, this amazing string group here in the Bay Area, in Los Gatos, down by San Jose, uh, in the South Bay. uh, They played this piece at the Midwest Clinic, and I was totally blown away. I said, okay, this this has to happen. We have to do this piece. It is amazing. Ordered the music. It came, and I realized that it was harder than I thought. It was listed. You wouldn't know what these terms mean in education speak, but I think it was listed as a grade four which with the or out of six, um, which is a level that might or it might even have been less than that. I don't know, but somewhere around there. It was definitely a level that the group I had could do. I was not doing it with my top group. I was doing it with my middle group, but I had a good middle group and I had a really good middle group that year. So I, I get the parts. I, I think I, I ordered, I think I printed them out like 10 minutes before class, which is always a bad move, but I did that <laughs> and, and passed them all out. And we started rehearsing. And one of the students said, uh, Mr. Heath, the sharps are in the wrong spot. I said, the sharps are in the wrong spot. What are you talking about? Then I looked. Yes, <laughs> the sharps were on notes that are not normally sharp. Ah, which is a really tough thing to do in an educational setting. So it was like, some of them were what you would expect. I think it was C sharp. F sharp, E sharp, and G sharp, maybe, or maybe it was even something else, like like uh, A sharp. I don't remember, but it was like very weird. So it was not what you were expecting on your fingers. Then he did the same thing with three flats, but not the right flats, not the typical flats, B flat, E flat, A flat. So that was tricky. And so what I ended up doing 
but and, and it, we had one of these uh, come to Jesus moments. The assistant orchestra director and I were, we were working on this thing, and you could tell. And it, but but one of the reasons why we wanted to do it is it held, had all this cool hip hop stuff later on in the piece, and and it just is super interesting. And I I remember watching the kids and watching them think. I don't know if they liked it. They definitely didn't hate it, but they definitely were talking about it. It was definitely, uh, and 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 there's something there when you get that reaction. Okay, I'm not necessarily looking for everybody to like it. I really, I, life is just too hard to have all teenagers in a room hate something. In my opinion, I just can't. I can't. Half of them would hate it all the time. Half half of them are always dissatisfied. But here, nah. I don't know. There were some people that were grooving on it. There were a lot of people that you could tell were just befuddled by it, but there, but there was definitely something there. So we finally decided, okay, we're going to make this happen. So what I did was I sat down in front of Finale, my music tool of choice in terms of editing and writing, and I entered that whole thing in to Finale, and I just turned it into C major, and I just added the accidentals where they should, where they are and that became a lot easier to read than the sharps in the non-traditional spots and the flats in the non-traditional spots. So that was the first thing that cleared up some confusion. Then though, there were these things that required intense synchronization that my string players, though they were good, were just it was like it was like uh, tightrope walk trying to get these things synced up. So what I did was I took those sound effects and I put them into a also the the tempo was it was just like one click too fast for my group. So I t- I took the sound files that had accompanied this. The, the, it was a sound for the students to listen to and then you had a click track for the director to listen to as well. And and so I put that all into Ableton Live. I had it so the click was just coming to me. The sounds were coming to the students. I was able to just scooch the tempo down like one, like I don't remember what the tempo was, but let's say it was 120. I moved it down to 116 or 114 even, and that was enough. And then there was this part that was just, it was just not, it was one in five that we'd come out right. So what I did was I, I added a very subtle kick drum in Ableton Live, just boom, 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 boom. Just enough for the students that were playing in that one section to hear it held together. And I am not uh, proud necessarily of this tactic, but I learned in, in my teaching jobs when I had an assistant, I learned you're rehearsing some pieces. You pick out some pieces, pick out like three pieces for a group, whatever. And this is bad educationally, but it's, it, it does work. Uh, you work on them, work on them, work on them. And then you can tell the kids don't like one of them so much. Give that one to the assistant. What happens? Whenever I walk up to the podium, they cheer, not for me, but because they're doing the pieces they like. Then that gives, then the assistant, if you got a good assistant, uh, says, yes, a project. I'm going to dig in. I'm going to make it happen. And they muscle it through and make it happen. And we're, and, and so we, I totally passed press along. I was like, Eric, this is yours. Run with it. Have a good time. And, and he, di- he did a fabulous job. But we get to the concert. And so we had to have Ableton Live. We had to have all these different things plugged into the, my MacBook Air that was up there. It all gets plugged in. And then he gets up to the podium and plunk, it all falls down everything and my macbook didn't fall but everything fell out there was like a big boom as the as the di box came disconnected and everything it was like this one of those your heart sinks you can hear the whole audience (gasps) go like that and i was just thinking oh my god this is on the precipice and and he set it all back up it went great i'll tell you what I don't know if the students loved it. I don't know if they hated it. I'll bet there was some of both, but everybody was talking about press, including that whole audience, every student. And 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 so um, that, that's a very different kind of project than the video game project, but I love those projects that sit on the edge and whether it was trying to figure out a way to teach electronic music without any written notation whatsoever, which is what I did, or any sort of music theory underpinning, which I realized could be controversial, but I did, and I, I stand behind it. It really is a good way to do it. Um, or any of these other projects. I think it's just so fun to experiment and and use this cont- the contemporary toolkit that we have like these 
amazing pieces of software and try to pull them into the orchestra world, try to pull them into the, the classroom setting. And even if I can figure out a way to do more of it in private lessons, I would love to do that. I hope this was interesting. Again, th these are things that I presented at various conferences and I'm just kind of experimenting here and getting some ideas out here. And I hope if you've gotten to this point, I'm assuming you at least quasi enjoyed it. So thank you so much for sticking with me. Normally there are many more people than just me. I'm not just preaching into this mic here by myself. Uh, I want to thank the Contrabass Conversations team, Mike Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, Mitch Morgan, and Krista Copper. They all rock. Thank you for listening to these. I appreciate it so, so much. And if you want to reach out to me, feedback at ContrabassConversations.com, and we will see you again soon for more life at the low end of the spectrum. <laughs>